Welcome back. It's segment two of Hawk TV, episode four with the common man, Dan Cole. Uh, Meat Sauce is back there somewhere doing something ridiculous. I'm not sure I what's going on. I didn't even realize he was here. Oh, yeah, he's back there behind the tree, and he usually just makes snide comments on his little uh, whiteboard. Normally, you can't even read them anyway, but he's back there because, really, honestly, I think he lives here under the stage somewhere. But, again, thank you for your time. And, and the first segment is behind us. Let's move into the second segment here. I want to. I have so much I want to ask you about, but, of course, we don't want to spend all day, and you have a show to do here. And just, I know you got a lot of show prep to do. A lot of show prep. A lot prep. of show prep. Right I want to talk about that because uh, uh, regardless, I don't want to blow, uh, blow the lead on that. But let's talk about, because you said you never went to college. I, I thought you went to Brown. Well, Brown, I guess yeah, that's, po- that's post-secondary education. I wouldn't call it um, I wouldn't call it college, even though they call it Brown College, right. where yeah. I got my knowledge. It was Brown Institute. When I, okay. went, when I tell people that say, I want to get into radio, Common, how did you do it? I say, well, I went to Brown Institute. And I tell them how much it cost back then. I think now it's literally... Oh. Thirty, forty thousand yes. dollars to get through the thing. Back when I went, it was thirty-two hundred dollars for right. a nine-month course. And yeah, I went to Brown Institute when back when the campus was down on uh, Lake Street. I had just I broken up with the first girl that I thought I was in love with, mm-hmm. and I was probably just in lust with. And then I thought to myself, well, why would I want to get hooked up with somebody like me? I had you know just a, you know not that there's anything wrong with a blue-collar job, but I really had I was doing a blue-collar job with really no chance for advancement or anything like that. I'm thinking, well, you got to do something. What do you want to do? And I thought. A buddy of mine had gone to Brown, and he was working at a job down in somewhere down south. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of fun. And my, my friends had always told me when we would play uh, uh, baseball games or whatever, I'd do a lot of play-by-play. Sure. And they always said, you should be in radio. You should do play-by-play. So I thought, well, that sounds kind of fun. And it seems like it's something to do. It's inexpensive. I found out I had to go get a GED, took that test. Um, but it was, you know, it wasn't very expensive. It was a quick and easy course, and it sounded like fun. What year was this? I graduated from Brown in 80. I went in 80, 81. So I started in late 1980, and I got out in the, uh, I think it was the spring of 81. Right. I was talking to Wild Bill Bauer the last time he was in studio with us a little bit, and about the time you guys have known each other, and he's obviously known your brother for a long time mm-hmm. with comedy. Did you do comedy back then at no, all? No, I never did. Petrified of it. I couldn't believe those guys could get on stage. Like really? That. Yeah. I just. But were I, you with them a lot? Oh, yeah. I, okay. Um, as a matter of fact, when they started the Mickey Finn's Comedy Night Club, I was doorman guy. Oh, okay. I would seat people, greet them, take the money, put them to the door, uh, uh, find a seat for them. Then I traveled with my brother uh, um, on many different occasions where we, we even went on one time like a six-month. We were gone for six months doing the college circuit out on the East Coast and down south just one night or after one night or after one night or so. I did a lot of traveling and was around the comedy scene for a long, long time. Back in the days when, you know, uh, my brother Alex and Billy and, and Cesario and Louis Anderson and all the others. I mean, the names I, I could list, maybe uh, uh, the, uh, the late Gary Johnson, the late Dan Bradley, mm. uh, the late Chris Rains, and so many other comics that um, Joel Madison, uh, there's just so many of them that all, they, they cut their teeth here in Minneapolis yeah. is where they got started. And But uh, you never got on stage? No, it wasn't, wasn't me. Really? Just, yeah, never. And now I, I, I dabble in it a little bit, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, was, I was always that, that's why I've always thought comedy personally is the toughest of all the show, but mm-hmm. you, you work in a band. Generally speaking, I would think, even if the people don't like you, you're having an off night, how many people boo or want you to get off stage? Movies and TV, yeah. there's no interaction with any kind of an audience at all because it's already done in the can, they show it. Mm-hmm. Usually people, uh, if you're in a theater production, don't do anything, uh, they, they won't do anything unkind or, or, or heckle the people that are in the production. In the radio, you don't hear anything other than an email or a caller. Sure. Comedy, you stand up on stage and people are there and they, most of them had a couple of drinks. A lot of them think they're funny. There's hecklers in there and they come with the edi- attitude, okay, funny guy, make me laugh. And boy, if you're up on stage and you're not getting any laugh. Well, Meat Sauce can attest to that. Oh, absolutely. You get up on stage and you're not getting any laughs. That's why I call, when I when I do comedy, I call my Flop, Sweat, and Tears tour because you'll get the Flop, Sweat. There's nothing worse than trying to be funny and people don't think you're funny. So I always thought comedy was the toughest and I never wanted to go through that because you never know how funny your material is until you use it. Yeah. You might think of it in your head and go, God, that's really, really funny. I'm going to go with that. Then you get up on stage and you deliver the line and you're waiting for the laughter and there's no laughter, just that uncomfortable silence. Man, you just start pouring. Sweat. Alex is your big brother, right? Yes, he's my older brother. Uh, are you surprised he hasn't ascended farther in comedy than he has? Well, yeah. I mean, it was. I think he's disappointed as well because he did think he would. He had some bad timing. Some of it brought on uh, uh, by himself, but he had some bad timing too, where he had had a contract, one of these development contracts with ABC Television, right. and it signed. You know, back then it was like a ten thousand dollar deal, which was a lot of money. But then all of a sudden the writer strike came on, and that was on for quite some time. So we never got a chance to get any kind of a pilot or anything like that. And yeah, you know, a lot of it's timing and luck of the draw, and you know, 
his comic stylings were more of a storyteller kind, and that's mm-hmm. just that kind of died out. There aren't many guys that can go and do a story. If you, if you go, if you see my brother work, he's really, really good. He's just any of the comics, any 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 of the comics today that that, that have reached, you know, in this town, there's two that have really hit it pretty big: Cesario and Anderson. Yeah. And 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 Cesario will tell you, and I I don't think he's just saying this. I think he truly believes it. He thinks that my brother was probably the the best of all of them as far as his mechanics and his delivery and just being a comedian. He was real good. But you know, my brother had a pretty good run though. I mean, he yeah. he worked. Um, he had a nice contract with the Desert Inn in Vegas and opened for a lot of big names down in Vegas. He shared the stage with the Gatlin brothers and the Everly uh and the Everly brothers and and worked with them. So he had a nice run. He right. did he did very well and he's, he's done well in theater and such like that. But mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I think all of us had kind of hoped that he would be one of those big names, reach the kind of heights that Louis did, but it just didn't work out that right. way. But not many get. I mean, think of all the comics out there. It's, uh, it's really difficult to achieve. I can't level. imagine how hard that life is. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Back to you, uh, you um, and radio, though. So, so you, you you're having a blue collar job. You go you go to Brown. Do do you go there specifically for radio? Oh yeah, specifically That's for what radio. And it's funny too because of the twelve people in our class and a couple of them work in this building still. Lee, Lee Valsvik was one. She was in your class. She was in my class. She now does mornings uh, for cities or uh, cool. uh, for cities ninety seven and cool. I think yeah. both. Mm-hmm. She um and then uh, uh, Roy Smith, who was in our traffic department. We were in the same class together. No kidding. Yep. And of of the twelve people in our class, I think we're the only three that are still in the business. But um. It was funny. Everybody else there wanted to be a disc jockey. Yeah. You know, spin hot stacks, sure. wax sunny skies today. I did not want to do that. I was in it strictly for news or sports. Not necessarily sports, news or sports. I just wanted to be a reporter type person. And that was the first job I got. The first job I got was in Great Falls, Montana in the summer of 81. Pretty nice market to start in, too. You know, 60,000 people in the market, wow. seven stations. And I was the morning news guy. And so that was my first job was doing news. Yeah. And you, you move out there specifically for that job by yourself? Specifically for that job by myself. That's that's what I tell people, too. You know, people say, hey, should I get in radio? And the first thing I ask them is, can you work for basically little or no pay? Yep. If you have a family, you shouldn't do it unless your wife has a job that's real. You know, it's it's movable. She can go somewhere and, and, and pick up a job a like nurse, a health care or something, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because there's very little money in it, and you got to go to a small town, and you go sight unseen. You're not going to travel out to a job that, you know, those that my first job was seven hundred and seventy five dollars a month. Yeah. When are we going to go travel to go check out the place? You take the job site unseen. You send them a tape. They say, yep, we like what we hear. Here's what the job is. Come on out and see us. And you go. And did so, you love it immediately? I, I what I did like was I tell people this all the time. I, I don't think I'm in love. You know, there's some people that love radio. I do. They you know, love radio. I do. I don't necessarily love radio. I just like the work that it's. It doesn't feel like work. So the first day I got to the job and finished my first day on the job where I gathered some news off the news wire and interviewed, you know, the mayor or city council member, interviewed him and then cut up the sound to go with the story. I just thought that was fun. Yeah, and that was that was for me. That was better than punching out parts at, you know, at, 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 at a, at a uh, machine shop. Sure. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that no, job, but, but for me, I like the idea. And of course, I, you get paid a lot less than you did at a machine shop back in those small markets. There's no money in that, but I liked the work. I just thought, this is, for, I'm talking on the radio. Yeah. And so I, I just, I, I kind of knew it was for me, and I, I always was a class clown in school and got a lot of trouble for talking. I can't. You know, you know, like you, you know, you start talking, you can't stop. You can't like stop. you fall in love with the sound of your own voice. Yeah. We like to joke <laughs> right. about it. Yeah. So I really just liked the work a lot. Tell me about um, your career career from then, though. So you go to Montana, and then where do you oh, go from there? Well, here's what happened in Montana. It was like um, I was doing news for three months. I'll never play my my tape for my first job. Right. I sound like Mickey Mouse, honestly, and I'm not exaggerating. Right. It sounds like I'm on helium because I didn't have the diaphragmatic breathing. So I talk like this, and my newscast sound just like that. And I was there for three months. And I went to the uh, the morning guy, who was the guy that hired me, and I said, hey, you know, you said it for three months, I could come and talk to you about a raise. He said, yeah, I'm glad you asked me. The, uh, the owner wants to see you. So I go up and see Bob Lockhart, the general manager, and I go, Bob, I'm here for a raise. He goes, I'm glad you came up to the office. You're not going to do news here anymore. I'm like, what? And he goes, now, we're making, a, we're making some changes. We're bringing in a heavyweight news guy, some guy. His name was Don Knott. Not the Don Knott yeah. that starred in uh, Andy Griffith, Andy Griffith right. but he was in Seattle work at KJR, working the nights. He wanted to get to a small town and be the guy, be the news director. So they hired him. The news director that, was, that I was working under, she got demoted and became um, news gal, you know, just sure. news reporter. And they said, I said, well, are you telling me that I'm done? They said, no, we really like your attitude and your hard work. We're going to have you do the overnight disc jockey shit, which was only a four-hour job at the time. Now, think about this. This how radio has changed. I don't know if this will interest your viewers at all, but it, it would you. Back in those days, we had live disc jockeys 
around the clock doing Absolutely. only a four hour shift. Yep. I was doing two o'clock to six in the morning. Then the news guy kind of took me under his wing. He let me volunteer. I would always have a shirt and a tie there. As soon as I got the dish check and I'd put it on, he'd send me out to go news, go down to the police station, go to the city council meeting, do this, do that. And so I kept doing news, but, um, and then a new program director came in and he never particularly cared for me. And almost a year to the day, uh, he called me in and I told my roommate, I said, he's, he wants me, he's firing me. No, he's not. I go, he's never asked me to come into the radio station in the middle of the day. And sure enough, I got in and that was it. Where'd so I was go? fired from my very first job. Where'd you go from there? Went to KLEE, Clee Radio in Ottumwa, Iowa, the home of Radar O'Reilly from MASH and Tom Arnold. That's Speaking right. Of Twin yeah. Cities okay, right. Well, it was funny because I got fired. Went home and had a job. I was only out of work an hour because I had actually been trying to get out of there because I wanted to do news. I didn't want to be a disc jockey. Sure. So I'd been looking for work, and my tape had gone to them. And uh, Pete Palin was the program director. It was a family-owned operation in a tumble, and he hired me um, to be a disc jockey, promising me I'd get some news, which I never did. Yeah. I, didn't get it. I didn't get a news job. But I, I, I called him up when I got home, and he said, yep, ready to offer you the job. It's all yours. $4 an hour. Uh, they wouldn't even give me a salary. It's $4, and you don't go over four, 40 hours a week. Well, uh, what year was that? 82. 82. The first job that I left home for was in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I got four seventy-five an hour. So I get a little bit more. A little bit yeah, more? Yeah, it jumped up a little bit more there. Yeah. So how long are you in Ottumwa? I was only there two months because wow. I didn't – Brown is permanent pay, placement list where you put your name on a list. Sure. I never took it off when I got the Ottumwa job. And then all of a sudden the Forest Lake radio station gave me a call. My home. That's where I went to school. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked sure. earlier in the first segment. So I came up to Forest Lake for the interview. You didn't tell them in Iowa I was going for the interview. Of course, you know? right. And uh, they offered me the job. Disc jockey, 5 at night to 11 at night. Got that job. Same thing. I had the squeaky voice, and uh, 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 the Carries were the ones that owned the radio station, uh, Ed and Joanne. And they said, you got to work on your voice. you got to really work on it. You're sounding too nasally. But couldn't figure it out. They fired me after three months. So now I'm out of a job. Again, I've been fired from two of the first three. Out of work for six months. To start to collect unemployment, I'm just sending letters out. My, my name is Dan Cole. i got a year and a half experience looking for work. The Cambridge radio station, which is now Love 105, yep. but at the time it was just a, you know, a small-town radio station, they had an opening, and they hired me. So I was doing 5 to 11 out there. Well, then some company that owned a couple of stations in Wisconsin, including Baldwin, came to town, bought this station from our owner, and uh, they let me go, too. They brought in some of, some of their people in Baldwin. Everybody wants to get back to the Twin Cities. There's so many Brown Institute grads that want to get back, yeah. and they had some people they promised jobs to. So then I got fired from that job. So now I'm out three out of my first four jobs, and uh, then I got a offer from a job in Kemmer, Wyoming, small little town in the southwest corner of Wyoming. And when I left town, I said to myself, if I get fired from this job, I'm done. Because it's, you know, four out of five dentists surveyed. Yeah. Four to five program <laughs> directors fire you. I'm done. It's and over. I went there and said this would be it. But I got into such a great situation. The general manager, Jimmy Ray Carroll, he, he, he died about two years ago. Uh, God bless him. Um, he, t- he took me under his wing. He, he had been a boxer at one time. Fought Curtis Cox, who was the welterweight champion in the world. He didn't fight him for the title, but he fought with him. He also worked in George Foreman's camp. And so I was a big boxing yeah. fan at the time. We hit it off right away. And I got so lucky because the sports director there, by the way, this is back in the day when the sports director, that's all he did. Think about that. In small market radio, he was just the sports director. He had culture shock. He had been from Los Angeles. He quit his job. I said, I'll be sports director. I was too naive to ask for a raise. I would have never got it anyways. But I'll do the sports. Then the guy that hired me, the program director, was doing the mornings and programming. He got an offer from his hometown in Lexington, Kentucky. About two months later, I said, I'll do that job, too, and Jimmy let me do that. And I worked with Jimmy for seven years altogether, including a short stint in Huntsville, Texas. But he let me make mistakes, and I was still a party guy then. And right. there were some times where I would be a little hungover on the air, but he, he put up with it because I worked hard. I was okay at what I did. I was willing to learn, and I worked cheap. And so we really got along well, and that's where I got a chance to really learn the business. Wow, so how many markets did you work in before you got back here? Well, then from there, we, I, I was in Kemmer, went to Huntsville, followed Jimmy down there for a little while, came back to Kemmer. He came back to Kemmer. Then I went from Kemmer, and I, 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 I traced my steps. I went from uh, Wyoming back to Minnesota and got a job in Cambridge. From Cambridge, I went to uh, Forest Lake and then Forest Lake here. So I actually worked, and I also had a one— I uh, I had a one day stint at K A N O in Anoka. I got hired one for day. part time and did a July Fourth shift, and then I got the offer from the Forest Lake Station to do uh, uh, to work there. So I only worked for uh, uh, Kano one day. 
Overnight sensation, huh? Well, yeah, right. That's Unbelievable, yeah, man. No. You know, I had no idea you had that many stops. Town to town, up and down the dial, like WKRP in Cincinnati. So says. many people here at this station. This is the radio station they started They at. started here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. There's something to be said for learning learning to do it And elsewhere. I did like it. You know, again, I, I um, none of the towns I worked in, the largest one I ever worked in was uh, Great Falls, 60,000. Yeah. Huntsville was probably 30, College Town, 70 miles north of Houston, which was a nice town to live in. But I liked getting to different places. I, I, I look back at those days, and even though, you know, I was, again, that was smack dab in the middle of my hate ashbury days. So I was, like, you know, a lot of radio guys are party guys anyway. Sure. The life of the party. I enjoyed those. They were small towns, but I enjoyed meeting different people, seeing what it was sure. like to live in different areas. I know so many people that have never... You know, they were born and raised in the seven county area and have never left. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I've always thought I would not have wanted to do it. I'd like traveling. I actually wish I would have lived in a few more places. But mm-hmm. I really enjoyed my, my time in, wow. in small towns. I did. That's Common Man Dan Cole. We got one more segment. We haven't even gotten to the fan yet. We got to learn about the birth of the common man because you weren't the common man in Huntsville. Nope. We'll find out about all of that and more. It's Hawk TV Episode 4, Common Man Dan Cole. Uh, we'll be right back. Heading out for the East Coast, Lord knows I paid some dues getting through. Tangled up in blue. 